it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, even though it's still only virtual and I still actually have yet to have the chance to physically visit Bombay. But um, but 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 hopefully, 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 someday soon, this all comes to enough of the end of an end that we all travel again. Um, so I just want to start with some very classical motivations and questions, and then I rearranged this talk slightly at the last minute, and, and I hope to say something about proofs today, and we'll see if that was a good idea and if I actually get there. Um, so just to start with very classical motivations, if I start with a compact manifold of negative curvature. It's always true that there are infinitely many closed geodesics. You know, this is often said as the geodesic flow has infinitely many closed orbits. Um, and a, this naive question you can ask is what about higher dimensional closed totally geodesic manifolds? So, you know, what if I look for closed totally geodesic surfaces instead of curves? Um, and there's a really strong folklore theorem um, that says if you just take a generic manifold, then there are no totally geodesic submanifolds of dimension bigger than one. Um, and this is a local result and has no curvature constraint. It's just, you know, if you look in a chart um, and you put a random metric on a chart, you will not see anything totally geodesic that's bigger than a geodesic. Um, and so in that sense, I'm going to stray away from random geometry. And I want to bring back random geometry by talking about the random elements of the proof. That's my, that's what my, my goal to keep with the um, title of your seminar. Um, and the counterpoint to this the folklore theorem that says these things mostly don't exist is an observation made by Reed in around 1991 that said there are compact and finite volume hyperbolic manifolds really in every dimension bigger than two that have infinitely many closed totally geodesic submanifolds of dimension bigger than one. So while these things don't show up if you pick a random metric on a manifold, if you like hyperbolic geometry, they occur in some sense quite frequently, um, or at least there are examples where they occur quite frequently. Um, and the theorem I wanna talk about today, I'm just gonna state a theorem to have it in the background is, uh, we're gonna have X tilde be an irreducible, rather that's X, an irreducible symmetric space of non-compact type, yeah, whichever. Um, you can take the asymmetric space to be irreducible or, or, or the quotient to be irreducible. Either one is fine by me because we'll get rid of this soon. Um, and we'll look at a finite volume locally symmetric space. And then the theorem that we proved in about 2020 says that if you contain infinitely many maximal closed totally geodesic submanifolds of dimension at least two, then gamma is arithmetic. Um, and this is sort of the, you know, it points out that things are even more restrictive, right? You know, I said you can't be generic, and now you can't even be non-arithmetic, which is a stronger condition. Um, wanted to find the terms in the theorem. First one is maximal, which just is what maximal always means, which is not contained in another proper closed totally geodesic submanifold. So if you know, if I'm in dimension three, every totally geodesic surface is maximal. If I'm in dimension five, then a totally geodesic surface might be contained in a totally geodesic four manifold. Um, um uh, David, can you just remind people about arithmeticity? Um, I'm about to, yes, okay. yes. Yeah. No, we, we will define everything on the slide, except I won't define irreducible symmetric space of non-compact type because I will just say that you can think hyperbolic space if you prefer. And in fact, the results only really new for real and complex hyperbolic space. And so if you don't like complex hyperbolic space, you should listen to my entire talk or most of it thinking of real hyperbolic space. Um, I do want to, before I define arithmetic, I just want to point out that, that, that really maybe the better way to think about this theorem is as a finiteness theorem. It says, unless gamma is arithmetic, and for now you should just think of that as very special, um, then totally geodesic submanifolds satisfy some kind of finiteness result. Um, so you know, this is somehow, it's a finiteness of, 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 you know, of, of special objects unless your original object is special. Um, and to get to arithmeticity, what you have to do is you have to say, oh, wait, this manifold, or at least its universal cover, is got a transitive action of its isometry group, which is a semi-simple Lie group. Um, the fundamental group is now sitting inside this Lie group as a lattice. You should remember that this Lie group is just a matrix group, and therefore it makes sense to, say, to look at the entries um, of the lattice and say, well, what you know, they, they clearly lie in the real numbers because I'm a Lie group, but it turns out that 
what arithmeticity means is that there is a number field where gamma is basically the integer points and you know the matrices with integer entries and the integer points of that number field. Um, and if you really want to think of um, this funny symbol k as being the rationals and this funny symbol o of k as being q and z, you really don't lose much. And in fact, up to slightly wiggling what you think of as g, that's more or less accurate. Um, so, you know, ar arithmetic really means is the integer points in some sense um, in some way of looking at the isometry group as matrices. Um, so, so, and again, if you don't know these things and don't like them, you can just think of arithmetic as very special. Um, um, although when I go through this history and reductions, um, it won't necessarily seem special again. And I realize I moved something off a slide that I'll just have to repeat verbally when I get there. So if X, my symmetric space has higher rank, this, this history and reductions is partly to be honest about history and partly just to um, say something about where the techniques are gonna come from. So in 1974, Mark Bull has proved that if you have a higher rank symmetric space, which is one where just the universal cover contains a totally geodesic Euclidean space of higher dimension, then the fundamental group is always satisfies this kind of arithmeticity. And if you're in quaternionic hyperbolic space or the Cayley hyperbolic plane, then Corlett and Gromo Shane proved that the space is also always arithmetic. Um, so the theorem, like I said before, is about real and complex hyperbolic manifolds of finite volume um, and responds to a question asked by Rita McMullen in the mid 2000s. And now I'm just gonna say verbally at least once the thing I took off a slide, which is that for real hyperbolic manifolds, which is maybe where the theorem is most robust, by various results, we know how to build lots of non-arithmetic examples. And in fact, there are reasonable senses in which non-arithmetic examples are generic. Um, um, the best result I know on that is the result of Galander and Levitz, but that there are others that you know, basically say that, you know, when I say arithmetic is special in these higher rank and quaternionic hyperbolic settings, that stops being true. In the real hyperbolic setting, it is very much true that arithmetic should be thought of as special. Um, in the complex hyperbolic setting, somehow we're, we're stuck and we don't know what the right answers are to many questions, including that one. Um, um, but what's the motivation for this? Well, one motivation is Margulis's commensurator super rigidity and arithmeticity theorems, which he proved more or less at the same time as he proved this, but these apply to the hyperbolic, to the hyperbolic geometry setting. And there's also an observation of Reed that says if the commensurator of the lattice is dense, then one totally geodesic submanifold implies there are infinitely many. Now, if this part of the slide's going too fast, don't worry, it repeats on the next slide. And I just want to clarify that this observation of Reed is really the same observation off the first slide. This is how he showed that there were a lot, you know, totally, you know, it was part of the same observation. Um, so let me talk a little bit about commensurators and totally geodesic submanifolds then. So, you know, we have this group G, which, you know, again, you're welcome to think of as SON1 um, throughout the talk. Um, and um, we have this lattice gamma sitting in G and we let the commensurator in gamma, commensurator in G of gamma be the set of Gs, where if I conjugate gamma by G, the resulting group has intersection with gamma that's find an index in both gamma and itself. So this is some sort of almost normality under conjugation by G. Um, you, you don't quite get the same group, but you only miss by a finite amount. Um, and this theorem of Margulis's says that if this commensurator is big, and by this we just mean it's really bigger than gamma, you know, it could be, you know, it could be contain gamma at finite index, in which case we think of it as basically the si same size as gamma. But if it's really bigger than gamma, then gamma is forced to be arithmetic. Um, and to illustrate one point, I'm going to mention that the converse is earlier in due to Borel. And the example for the converse is just, you know, if I look at SLNZ, so even SL2Z, if you don't like higher n, um, and you look at the commensurator in SLNR, 
um, than what you get out of the rational matrices. And this is something, you know, there are fancy ways to prove this, but this is something you can do as a by hand matrix computation and just see that, you know, if I conjugate integral matrices by some fixed rational matrix, uh, the denominators are bounded. And so I get this finite intersection condition. Um, um, and so the other point to make from this is that when I say here, it contains gamma at infinite index, well, it turns out that this is always what's true. If it contains gamma at infinite index, then by essentially Margulis's result, you end up seeing that it is the rational points. And so it's always dense if your group is arithmetic and that's equivalent to being arithmetic. Um, and now commensurators are a little bit weird if you're a geometer of any kind because they don't immediately have an apparent meaning. But if, you know, may, probably many of you have heard this before, uh, commensurators are best in, thought of as sort of hidden symmetries of the manifold, which is that, if G commensurates gamma, then what this turns out to mean exactly if you translate it into geometry is that G is an isometry on some finite cover of the manifold X. Um, so you get an isometry of a finite cover. Um, and Reed's idea is say, for, for this observation that I said before, where he takes one totally geodesic submanifold and builds from it lots of them, is he takes a totally geodesic submanifold, he lifts it to some cover x prime, and you choose to list it, lift it to some x prime where some extra g is an isometry. And then you push m by this g, and you push it back down to x. And you check that out of this process, you've gotten a new totally geodesic submanifold. And you have to be a little careful here, right? You don't want g to be, um, yeah. It turns out to, to see that this is really robust, you need that not only is the commensurate gamma infinite index in the commensurator, but the commensurator is dense. But once the commensurator is dense, this is very robust and tells you essentially that there are totally geodesic submanifolds near every point and in every direction in the manifold. So what this tells us in the end is that if I have an arithmetic manifold and there is at least one totally geodesic submanifold, then the totally geodesic submanifolds are everywhere. Um, and there is a technical question that I'm going to mostly avoid here, which is, okay, if I give you an arithmetic manifold, uh, does it have any totally geodesic submanifolds? And the answer in dimension three is tricky and higher dimensions for, you know, is somewhat less tricky because there are fewer constructions, but, um, but it, it, the answer is, 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 is you can tell is, is, you know, there are ways to compute this. Um, in terms of the data associated to an arithmetic manifold, and people like Reed know how to do this. So, yeah. yeah. So, so, so this is something one can do. Um, and now, what I want to do is talk about the brief history of the results leading up to our main theorem today, which I include just because I find it amusing at this point. Which is, you know, this question was asked by Reed and McMullen probably around 2005, 2007, formally, and at least some people I know who know them claim at least that Alan Reed was asking it over beer at least five years earlier. Um, so, you know, people have been curious about this for a while. And the first cases were proven by myself with a slightly different author list with LaFont, Miller, and Stover in 2018, um, where we proved this for some constructions given by Gromov and Piotetsky Shapiro. Uh, a key idea in our argument also appeared in a paper of Ben Moano where they were doing something different. Um, so there was some sort of competition there in some sense, although they really were trying to do something different. Um, yeah, so um, the, the second uh, result was in 2019, you know, and, and these two papers were, you know, essentially simultaneous. And in 2019, again, there are two more essentially simultaneous papers. One where with Botter, Miller, and Stover, we prove the real hyperbolic result. So that if a real hyperbolic manifold is not arithmetic, there are only finitely many maximal totally geodesic submanifolds. And around the same time, Margulis and Mohammadi proved it for compact three manifolds. Um, you know, we proved it for all finite volume manifolds in dimension, any dimension, and they proved it in dimension three. Um, 
the proofs have some similarities, but are really very different. And you know, when I first started talking about this and didn't understand their proof and had only talked to them about a little bit, I, I would say that I had faith that their proof would eventually be as, as general as ours, but it turns out that their proof is really not as robust as ours. And you know, there are conjectures that would allow their proof to work in all dimensions, but it would really require considerably more work to make their proof work as generally as ours does. Um, um, and then in 2020, with Botter, Miller, and Stover again, we proved the complex hyperbolic case. And in this case, they're really, again, almost immediately afterwards. I guess this one, there's a slightly longer gap. You know, Baldi and Olmo had heard Botter give some talks on this. They produced their preprint slightly faster than we did. Um, you know, there were some some disruptions in 2020. I can't remember why. Um, um, but but um, but um, we um, we handled the complex hyperbolic case, and and they handled part of the complex hyperbolic case. This this part I find much more intriguing because um, their proof has nothing to do with our proof. Our proof is very much using dynamics and ergodic theory, and their proof is using Hodge theory and ohm minimality and um, their parts in their proof have now become a proof by them and Bruno Klingler proving a much more general finiteness result for special subvarieties of projective varieties, uh, stuff that I barely understand. Um, in the case of complex hyperbolic manifolds, our theorem is still somewhat better than ours, theirs, but theirs leads in entirely different directions. Um, and in a way that's very interesting and I don't understand yet. Um, um, the last thing I'm going to say on this slide is just that totally geodesic manifolds play a key role in hyperbolic geometry. And when I've given this talk in the past, I've gone on some sort of historical digression here to tell you why. And I do have those two slides sort of at the end of my slide deck um, or five slides or whatever it is, but um, oh, I'm sorry. Did not mean to do that. Um, 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 but um, but 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 I, I don't want to go on that digression because I want to tell you a little bit more about how we prove things. Um, and I, I guess the the one thing I should say here, and 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 if I was better at drawing pictures in slideshows, I would have, um, is that one of the things one does with totally geodesic submanifolds is you know Gromov and Piotrowski Shapiro actually use them to give a robust way of building non-arithmetic hyperbolic manifolds. Um, and it's sort of the children of the gromov piatetsky shapiro uh, method, you know, developed by people like Egel and Galander and Levit and Billy Patetsky and Thompson and many others that really tell you that non-arithmetic manifolds are what, you know, dominates in hyperbolic geometry, at least in dimension above three and dimension three you can see this using hyperbolic vein surgery, but that's very special to dimension three. Um, so before we go on to talk about proofs, I just wanna tell you a little bit about what totally geodesic subspaces look like. Um, so in hyperbolic end space, it's really quite simple. Uh, all totally geodesic subspaces are just hyperbolic subspaces. So if I'm in H3, that's copies of H2 and geodesics. If I'm in H4, it's copies of H3, copies of H2 and geodesics. Um, and those are all the totally geodesic subspaces you can get. And so when I'm looking in this compact manifold, that's a compact quotient of the space, all I can get in say a hyperbolic four manifold are you know, folded up closed totally geodesic hyperbolic three and two manifolds and so on and so forth in other dimensions. Um, and then if I'm in complex hyperbolic geometry, instead life gets a little bit more colorful in that inside of the complex hyperbolic n space, there are complex hyperbolic k spaces for every value of k less than n. And there are also real hyperbolic k spaces for every value between two and again n. You really have an HN sitting in a CHN. I mean, if you don't know any complex hyperbolic geometry, this is maybe not informative, but you should just think of it as somehow the complexification of, of, of real hyperbolic geometry. And so, you know, CHN is the complexification of, of HN and, 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 and therefore contains HN as some sort of real submanifold. 
And you know, so these are what are called complex submanifolds, and these are called real submanifolds. Um, and CH1 is, is a weird creature in that it's a hyperbolic plane in CHN, but it has curvature minus four. There are also hyperbolic planes in CHN that are real, and those are the planes with curvature minus one. Um, and so you know, you have these two different flavors of hyperbolic planes in complex hyperbolic space. Um, and the isometry group of complex hyperbolic space is SUN1, and the H2 orbits are orbits of S. O2 one, which sits in SUN1, and the CH1 orbits are orbits of SU11. Um, you know, these are just naturally both subgroups of this SUN1. Um, and now I want to talk about how we get to dynamics and ergodic theory and what is for me my version of randomness. So the frame bundle of HN is SON1. You know, the isometry group in this case turns out to be the frame bundle. Um, so the frame bundle of my quotient X turns out to be SON1, which I'm now going to relabel G mod this lattice gamma. And in X, it turns out that closed totally G to the submanifolds of dimension K come from orbit closures of this W, which is SOK1 sitting in SON1. The reason I have to say orbit closure here instead of closed orbits is that um, if you think about it even for a little bit, um, I guess the example to think of is maybe just, a, you know, to go down a dimension too far is you think about a geodesic sitting in H3, its stabilizer is not just translations along it, but also rotations around it. If you go up a dimension to H4, if I look at a hyperbolic surface in H4, its stabilizer is not just the isometries that act transitively on that surface, but rotations around it. Um, and this happens in all dimensions and co-dimensions. You have this possibility of extra, extra isometries preserving your totally due to that submanifold coming from rotations in the transverse directions. Um, and this introduces some compact proofs, which make the proofs, the actual proofs of some things in the papers quite a bit noisier than they are intuitively, but it actually adds no real difficulty. Um, it's just, you know, it's, you know, one has to deal with what's true rather than the cartoon one has in one's head, but, but it, it really doesn't make a difference other than making it harder to read. Um, and I guess the thing to notice is, you know, SO11 is the diagonal matrices. And so really the geodesic flow is given and geodesics are given by a subgroup of this flavor. Um, and for CHN, life gets a bit more complicated if you want to translate into geometry. SUN1 is the bundle of not just all frames, but complex frames. Um, NW that gives you a totally digital submanifold could be SUK1 or SOK1. And orbit closures of this guy give you the complex totally geodesic submanifolds, and orbit closures of this guy give you the real totally geodesic submanifolds from the previous slide. So everything now turns into studying orbit closures of some group W on G mod gamma, where G is always either SON1 or SUN1, and W is always either SOK1, SUK1, or SOK1. So you know we're studying just some fixed class of dynamical systems where the only thing that really varies a lot is gamma. You know, the, the, the choices of W and G are finite in all cases, but gamma is, is sort of a random object. It's, you know, it's, I'm handing you a, man, a hyperbolic manifold and, and telling you to study this dynamical system on its frame bundle, or I'm handing you a complex hyperbolic manifold and telling you to study this dynamical system on its complex frame bundle. Um, and so now I just want to tell you how you think of this theorem in terms of homogeneous dynamics, which is really how it's proven. Um, so we're going to let W act on G mod gamma, as on the last slide. And now we just call a W orbit closure maximal if it's not contained in a larger proper W orbit closure. Um, you know, maximal orbit closures correspond exactly by a dictionary to maximal totally geodesic submanifold. So this is a good thing to do. Um, and if there are infinitely many maximal or W orbit closures in G mod gamma, then, we, then, then what we prove is that gamma is arithmetic. And this is really what we prove. We don't, you know, 
you can quibble a little bit with how we wrote things down in some cases, but really this is the, this is the theorem um, that is proven by the proof. Um, and so, so, you know, we, um, we want to study this dynamical system and somehow relate it to properties of gamma, which seems at least at first a little absurd because, you know, there's not any obvious connection between the structure of gamma and this system, at least that's, you know, transparent. I mean, you know, somehow in orbit, something about some group containing W having some conjugate that in intersects a gamma in some lattice. And it's not, does not seem like an easy thing to turn that information into some statement about arithmeticity. But luckily we have some uh, coaching and advice coming from Margulis and his earlier work um, where he tells us that if we want to prove arithmeticity, we should prove superrigidity. And so on this slide, I'm going to give you a primer of what superrigidity is about that will go a little too quick, but it's just to give you an idea. Um, so, you know, G is some simple group and gamma and G is some lattice. And again, you can keep G as SON1 here. Um, and now we have some other algebraic group, L and K, some other local field. Um, and, you know, this may be too much, but one thing I'm thinking of here is K being a piadic field. And I could just take my matrices for SON1, I could look at their rational points, and I could complete their rational points with respect to a piadic norm, and then I get a piadic algebraic group. And the fact is, what, what superrigidity is, is a gives you a criterion for when rho from gamma to L extends to G as long as the image is what's called Zariski dense, you know, not contained in any proper algebraic subgroup. And it turns out that if you look at Margulis's original proof of arithmeticity from superrigidity, you know, he proves a very general superrigidity theorem from which he concludes arithmeticity. But if you look more carefully, you need superrigidity for some relatively small collections of choices of rho, k, and l. Um, and here I use some fancy words to say that, you know, what we need are the same complexification as G. Uh, Margulis calls this absolute in his book that seem to be quite Carmen parlance, though it should be. Um, um, and it also turns out that um, I'm being warned my internet connection is unstable. If I should uh, fritz out, please do say something. Um, um, so from now on, you know, we're back in the case where G is SON1 or, or, or SUN1. And basically the Ls that can occur in the, in the previous slide when I'm trying to prove superrigidity are groups of the form SOPQ and SUPQ where, you know, instead of picking N1, so instead of saying picking 4, 1, I pick 2, 3. Um, it turns out these groups occur when one plays certain games trying to prove arithmeticity from superrigidity. And now what I'm not going to do is tell you how that proof goes um, because, well, it's classical and I want to tell you something new instead. Um, but it's a very pretty idea um, that um, how you use superrigidity to prove arithmeticity um, where um, it, um, you know, Margulis once told me that he asked Jacques Tietz if his way of proving arithmeticity from superrigidity had been known before. And, and Teach's answer was no. And so this, this too was an original idea, not just that the proof of superrigidity, but that superrigidity had something to do with arithmeticity. And you could give this sort of proof of arithmeticity was new in 1974. Um, but here we're looking at this totally geodesic submanifold given by orbit closures of some W. And um, I guess something I didn't say before is, you know, because there are only finitely many choices of W and or assuming there are infinitely many totally submanifolds, you can always, you know, just by pigeonholing, fix one W and study it. Um, um, so we're really restricted to one dynamical system of some W on G mod gamma. And it turns out the Ws we're interested in just turn out to be these simple non-compact subgroups of SUN1 or SON1 that, that fully characterizes the groups we're looking at. Um, and they are given explicitly as I did on the slides before. And 
now assuming L is you know basically one of these guys, and we can do a little better than this, but for now we'll just assume L is one of these guys, and assume that we have rho from gamma to L with non-compact or risky dense image. Well, then our theorem says that this extends to G, provided uh, we have W as above and some J and L, some algebraic subgroup, and some gamma equivariant map from G mod W to J mod L. I mean, L mod J, sorry, not that backwards. This is a slightly strange condition unless you know the history of, of proofs of this kind. Um, um, uh, it turns out to be a nice condition. Um, how do you think of G mod W? This, this you can think about geometrically. This is a little, on the right-hand side is a little too arbitrary to think of geometrically, but on the left-hand side, you can think of if you just restrict yourself to the setting where say SL2, G is SL2C or SO31 and W is SL2R or SO21, then this G mod W turns out to be just the space of totally geodesic planes in G. It's also the space of uh, the space of totally geodesic planes in the hyperbolic three space. It's also the space of uh, round circles at infinity on the boundary of your hyperbolic space. Um, you know, this is always just the space of totally geodesic submanifolds of some particular type in Rx. And we have some map to that, to some algebraic variety. Um, and what I'm saying is as soon as you have this map, um, and it, it is, you know, necessary that this uh, J and L be proper so that this be a non-trivial algebraic variety. Uh, and this map is gamma equivariant, which says there's some dynamics involved. Then even though the map is only measurable, this is already enough to prove that G extends to a, you know, that, 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 that my representation of gamma extends to a representation of G, which again is, is somewhat surprising if you don't know a little history, which I believe is what's on my next slide. Um, yes. This is history and proof outline in one slide. So perhaps I should take it slowly. Um, so just sort of recapping, there are gonna be two steps in our proof. The first step is gonna to be to build this input that that theorem needs. I wanna build a gamma equivariant measurable map from this space of totally geodesic subspaces to some algebraic variety that's non-trivial. And from that, we're just going to somehow study properties of gamma equivariant measurable mappings to extend rho. Um, and you should be suspicious of two unless you have studied Margulis's work. Um, and, and Margulis once described to me his proof of um, super rigidity as the incompatibility of ergodic theory with algebraic geometry. And that's really sort of what we're going to use here is that somehow the gamma action on G mod W has a lot of random dynamical properties. And since L mod J is an algebraic variety, actions on it are very um, tame and can't have random geometric properties. And that really is what drives the proof here. The interesting thing is um, developments since Margulis's work have proven that you really need very, very little from algebraic geometry. Um, it still is incompatibility of measure theory with algebraic geometry, but it's not fancy algebraic geometry in any sense. Um, and for us, this step one uses a lot of homogeneous dynamics, including Ratner's theorem and some work of Dunny and Margulis um, to study measures on certain bundles over this G mod gamma. And step two uses ergodic theory of actions on algebraic varieties. Um, and now I just wanna tell you you know, sort of how this comes to be as a proof and where it comes from in Margulis's work. Margulis, when he went to prove arithmeticity, used a very simple, similar outline, um, except his gamma equivariant map, rather than being from G mod W or the space of totally geodesic submanifolds, was from G mod P, where P is a minimal parabolic. And so you can think of this as from the boundary at infinity to some algebraic variety. Um, his proof of step one was very much the easy part of his proof, even originally. And the proof of step one was then su substantially simplified by Furstenberg and Zimmer to be even simpler. Um, and is really at this point in history is the proof of this step one is almost trivial. Um, and 
it actually also works for rank one groups, um, which is not useful for Margulis. Um, and then in step two, he again uses the, the, the ingredients we use are sort of a variation on his ingredients where he uses higher rank and centralizers and the ergodic theory of algebraic actions. One real innovation in our step two is that we pass from using centralizers to using normalizers because in a rank group like SL2C, very few subgroups have centralizers. You know, there's just not enough room for any two subgroups to commute in an interesting way. And so you have to instead look at groups that normalize one another. In higher rank, there are lots of subgroups that commute. And that's really sort of the key to Margulis's proof. Um, and um, yes, so that's a lot for one slide. And I just want to say, you know, that the proof structure is parallel, um, but somehow our step one is a lot heavier than his step one. And our step two is a lot trickier than his step two, just because, you know, centralizers are easier to work with than normalizers. And, you know, his step one is something that really comes from the universal property of amenable groups and very easily at this point. And, and our step one has to come from something very special because our theorem is conditional. Um, you know, there are non-arithmetic hyperbolic manifolds, so we better not prove there aren't any. In his case, he's working in a setting where there are no non-arithmetic things and he's proving that. So you're allowed to use much more universally valid arguments because um, you're proving a universal theorem. Um, so now I just want to say before I go on to try and outline steps one and steps two is that in the complex hyperbolic case, we encounter some kind of weird obstruction. And in the case of that obstruction, which maybe I'll get a chance to describe for you at the very end of the talk, we build what we call a geometry preserving map from the boundary of hyperbol complex hyperbolic space to itself. And Geometry preserving maps have a lot of history in rigidity theorems. Um, Mostow famously used a theorem of Tietz about instance geometry to prove Mostow rigidity in 1972. This was then used by lots of people to prove QI rigidity theorems, you know, Kleiner, Lieben, Eskin, Farb, and Eskin. Um, and then with my student, Nguyen, former student Nguyen, and with Kevin White, we used these things to prove QI super rigidity theorems. And in a very different direction, Berger and Iotzi and Pozzetti and Duchenne Lucaro Pozzetti used them to study maximal representations of lattices in SUN1. And lastly, the Margulis and Mohammadi proof that works for a special case of our theorem is also an instance geometry proof. Um, you know, I really should perhaps um, see if I remember how to do this. I should perhaps, you know, try and circle this one. It's, you know, we, we, we really, you know, we use this one in our proof um, is, is what we do. I will say that Margulis and Mohammadi were very much inspired by Mostow's proof. Um, it's interesting that Berger and Yotzi were in some sense inspired by that, but they're also inspired by an even older incidence geometry result of Carton that um, I didn't put on the slide and probably should have. Um, th there are instance geometry results in, in the theory of semi-simple Lie groups going back even to the early part of the 20th century. So this is a, a long tradition that suddenly pops up in our proof in the complex hyperbolic case and doesn't really pop up in the real hyperbolic proof. Um, so now, oh, and now I have to, I always forget this foible of Zoom, where if you annotate a slide, you then have to erase it, where it appears on all future slides. Um, um, so what's the, um, what's the first step in the proof? We want to build this map from G mod W to L mod J. And what we're going to first do is we're going to find a good representation of L on some vector space. And our goal is going to be to find a W invariant measure on a P of V bundle over G mod gamma that projects to Har measure. How am I going to build this bundle? Well, we have a representation from gamma into L. So gamma acts on the vector space. And I'm just going to build a flat vector bundle. And then I can just projectivize my flat bundle. So I have a vector bundle easily. 
um, and a projective bundle easily. And now I want to find a measure on it. And once one has this measure, it really is old ideas basically developed in the context of Margulis's proof of super rigidity that turn this invariant measure into a measurable map of this kind. I guess technically in our papers, we don't use uh, their old ideas, but some more recent renditions of them by Bader Galander and Bader de Chen Le Carre to actually produce this map. Um, but you know, they're, 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 you, you could produce this map from this invariant measure in any of a number of ways. It's not, you know, once you have the invariant measure, it's not hard. It's not anything that's surprising to people who have been working in the area. Um, um, and now how do we get a measure on this projective bundle? Well, my total geodesic submanifold in X corresponded to a W invariant measure on G mod gamma. Or if you were already on my dynamical cis theorem, which I claimed you were, my W orbit closure supports the W invariant measure. Um, and the data define a vector, you know, we have this vector bundle E over G mod gamma with fiber V that I already mentioned that comes from this flat bundle construction. Um, and we have the associated P of V bundle which I'll call F over G mod gamma. And the point is that if we choose V correctly, then for every time there's a W invariant measure mu sub i, over that W invariant measure, there's an invariant line bundle in E. Um, and this is just some choice you have to make. You make some choices of the representations, you use some properties of gamma that are not trivial, and you can choose this. And what's the point of having a line bundle? Is a line bundle is a section of the projective space bundle. And so if you have a section of a bundle, you can use, you can just push forward your measure on your orbit closure up to the bundle. Um, it's not a very exciting operation, really. It's just saying, oh, yeah, okay, I can push this bunt this measure up. I have this measure on this projective bundle. Um, it comes from some sort of degeneracy over the closed W orbits of the vector bundle. Um, and then you just take a weak star limit of these measures. And what we need to know at this point is that this measure projects to Har measure on G mod gamma, the limit measure. Because we want, uh, and, and the, let me just, yeah, the key tools for doing that are, are, are things from Ratner's theorem classifying W invariant measures on G mod gamma and a theorem of Moses and Shaw on limits of W invariant measures proved using Ratner and using work of Donnie Margulis. And why do I care that this is Har measure? I didn't put this on the slide, which is bad. I care that this is Har measure because um, I will actually write this down again. I want this map from, Let's see if this works better. G mod W to L mod J. I want to build this map. And I want this, to, I'm only going to say this is a measurable map. And it turns out that having this measure be Har measure on G mod gamma is the same as having this map be measurable for the standard measure algebra on G mod W. If it's some other random fractal measure on G, I'll still get this map, but it won't respect Har measure on G mod W, but you know, it won't be measurable with respect to the Har measure algebra, but to some other horrible fractal measure algebra that won't remember any of the structure of G mod W. So um, I really need Har measure here, or what I've done is useless. And that's where the big machinery from homogeneous dynamics comes in, is that you need to um, do that in order to um, to, 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 you know, you need to use that in order to get a map that is in fact useful. Um, all right, um, probably shouldn't do that, yes. And so now in step two, you know what, in step two, I, well, I left this here and that's convenient. I'm gonna just be studying properties of this map and trying to use this map to extend my homomorphism. And what I'm gonna tell you a little bit about now is something that I think is a wonderful development in the theory. Um, and this wonderful development is not due to me, but due to Botter and Furman, 
where they have built uh, really a better proof of Margulis's super rigidity theorem. Margulis doesn't agree with me, but but you know people are allowed to prefer their own proofs to the new one. Um, the new one is somehow very much easier. It uses um. I also annoyed Bob Zimmer by telling him about this proof, and basically, you know, the standard place to learn Margulis's proof these days is probably still Zimmer's book on ergodic theory and algebraic groups, and. Uh, if you want to read the proof of Margulis's arithmeticity theorem, you have to read about 100 pages of that book. If someone were to write the book, which no one has done yet, and give the Bader Furman proof instead, at the same level of exposition, it would take about 60 pages, is my guess. So, you know, I think you could, you know, you, you, you know, when they write their proof, they're aiming at generalizations, so they don't write the, the shortest version of, of the classical theorem but it really does give a shorter proof of the classical theorem, what they're doing, um, and is a simpler idea. And to do what they're doing, they define a widget called an algebraic representation. And this is, you know, this becomes, um, um, Bader is very passionate about the fact that what they're doing is category theory. And like all categorical approaches to things, the um, difficulty in the proof becomes getting the definitions right, and then the proofs are trivial. Um, um, I never thought I was going to work in this style, but in this paper we do. Um, and the um, hard part then is the definition, and that's what I'm about to give you. Um, so I have T sitting in G, which is a closed subgroup. A T algebraic representation is given by some data. First, I have an algebraic subgroup J and L. Then I have a homomorphism from T to the normalizer in J of J. Why do I want a homomorphism to this group? Well, if I wanted to find a right T action on L mod J, this is exactly what's required. You know, if I want to act on the right where I have to pass through the J, I have to be in the normalizer of J. And then the part of the image that lands in J acts trivially, and it's really an action by the normalizer of J mod J. So we, you know, this homomorphism just comes from having the desire to have a right T action on L mod J. Um, and then the last datum in this thing is a measurable map from G to L mod J, which is gamma equivariant for the gamma action on the left on L mod J and T equivariant for the T action on the right on L mod J. And um, it turns out that for historical reasons, we prefer to have gamma and T act on the opposite sides on G. So gamma acts on the right and the target and on the left, I mean, on the left in the target and on the right in the domain and T acts on the left in the, domain and on the right in the target. And probably that's a mistake that we should all stop making. But there really is some trick in some part of this proof where the fact that you're changing sides is, is conceptually useful. Um, and now before I put something over it, I should undo my little symbols at the bottom. Or maybe I should not undo them and say, uh, this map here you can think of as, an, as a W algebraic representation just by lifting out W. Um, you can lift out W. You can think of this as a map from G to L mod J, which is W equivariant, where W acts in the given way on G and trivially in the, in the range. So this is actually an algebraic representation, and that's important. What we've built is an algebraic representation, and we're going to use that to build others. Um, and now I should get rid of it, because I believe I'm about to put more text there. Um, um, and now there's a funny thing that happens, which is that algebraic representations, you know, you think of them as associated to some subgroup T, but it turns out that you can end up with the same map. I could take, you know, one group T and another group S and end up with this same equivariant map. Um, and homomorphisms and S from S and T both into this normalizer. Um, and there's a really easy proposition um, in a paper of Bader and Furman, which actually, um, sadly, they don't state the proposition. They do state in line, um, um, and 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 they really should have stated and proved this proposition, which says that if I have some collection of groups that generate G topologically, and assume they all have algebraic representations with the same map and trivial stabilizer, 
then rho extends. So what this is, what this proposition is, is a, um, it's an, a criteria for when the homomorphism from gamma to L extends to G in the language of these algebraic representations. Um, and the proof of the proposition really is basically trivial. Um, and, you know, the hard part really is swallowing this definition um, and learning to manipulate it a tiny bit. Um, and it turns out to be relatively easy, but, um, but it is, you know, I don't know, you know, I decided to, 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 to proselytize for their definition and its use in this talk. And therefore, um, uh, if there are questions about this definition, I should take them now. Um, just because it is, it's, it's a bit of a handful. Um, 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 but it's a really useful idea. Um, and I suspect is useful for other things other than proving super rigidity, super rigidity theorems. I should also say, you know, to leave it on the slide a little while longer and talk a little more about it. I should also say that if you look in Margulis's original proof of super rigidity, certainly don't see this normalizer. Uh, if you stare at his proof for long enough, you will actually um, sorry, see David, okay. Yeah, David, you, you, you froze out for the last one minute. Okay. Well, I will repeat myself then. That's fine. Um, so uh, what I was saying was, you know, if you look in Margulis's original proof of this, this super rigidity theorem, you won't see an algebraic representation written on the page or this definition written on the page, but you will eventually, if you stare at it for long enough, you'll find such a thing. Um, so, you know, this, this idea is somehow implicit in Margulis's proof, but Botter and Furman fully deserve credit for making it explicit. Um, and it really makes life easier um, when it is explicit rather than implicit. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, Margulis's proof gets very complicated because this idea is implicit, not explicit. Um, and it also not only gets complicated, it gets hard to understand why it works um, and hard to generalize. Um, so, now, now what I want to tell you is a little bit about how you work with these algebraic representations. Um, and like I said before, this algebraic representation is one. It's a W algebraic representation. And what that means is that I have an algebraic representation from, for W and also for any subgroup of W. And that's a useful thing to know. Um, that's non-trivial. Um, and I'm going to give you a slightly bastardized version of the definition from Botter and Furman, which says, if I look back at these T-algebraic representations, there is always a best one. Um, and the best one, you know, I'll put, go back to the other slide. The best one is the one where, you know, you can already see here that we want J to be small. We want J to be trivial to extend our homomorphism. So the best one is the one with J being the smallest possible. Um, um, and, you know, J is only defined up to conjugacy. So this is really minimal up to conjugacy. Um, and the fact is such an initial object exists. And at this point in the proof, you really are using some algebraic geometry. Why are you using some algebraic geometry? Is because, well, you know, if I, if I wasn't using algebraic geometry, I might have a sequence of subgroups of L that got smaller and smaller. And it could be an infinite sequence. The Noetherian property of L prevents that from happening. You know, there are, you know, the, chains of subgroups of algebraic groups have lower bounds. Um, it's just, you know, that's a very soft bit of algebraic geometry that we're using here. Um, and this initial object is, you know, I'm not calling it initial because I um, want to found, sound fancy. I, I'm calling it initial because it is an initial object in the category of algebraic representations, which means that all other algebraic representations factor through it which is, you know, given some other algebraic representation, phi prime from G to L mod J prime, that's also T algebraic, then J is contained in J prime and phi is just a composition of this map. Phi prime is just the composition of this map from to L mod J prime and the projection from L mod J to, you know, uh, phi prime is a composition of this guy with the obvious projection given by taking a larger subgroup, 
And, you know, there's some little fuss in here and that, you know, all everything here is only defined up to conjugacy. Um, um, but, but, but it really is, you know, quite simple, even despite that. Um, and, and what Botter and Furman prove is that if the T action on G mod gamma is weak mixing, then there is an initial T rep algebraic T representation. Um, this proof is, is uses, you know, it uses the Notharian property the way I just said, it uses a tiny bit more algebraic geometry and uses really that, you know, this weak mixing property is some sort of ergodic random property of this action on G mod gamma. And basically what it's using is there are no weak mixing actions on algebraic varieties. Um, um, and, 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 and that is sort of how this proof runs. It uses that the action is random on G mod gamma and can't be random on the algebraic variety. It's not a hard proof. Um, and then really this, this part is incredibly soft and just categorical, which says that it, it says that if I have an initial T representation, it's also an initial representation for the normalizer of T. So this sort of theory of representations using a little bit of ergodic theory, this theory of algebraic representations becomes a useful object. And maybe I can close by giving you the basic proof strategy um, since I'm running out of time. And this is the basic proof strategy in the real hyperbolic setting. So we start with our map from G mod W to L mod J from step one. And now we're gonna do step two using what was on the last few slides. Um, and as I've already said, we view this representation as a W algebraic representation from G to L mod J, where the W action on L mod J is trivial. And we look at the parabolic subgroup in G, and we look at its unipotent radical. Um, and we then intersect that unipotent radical with W. It gives us a unipotent subgroup of W. And since phi is a W algebraic representation, it's also an algebraic representation of this subgroup. Um, and then what we do is we say, oh, but we don't like this representation on that subgroup. We like better the initial representation. Um, and an interesting thing already happened here was the fact that this map exists and is non-trivial implies this map exists and is non-trivial. So we now have an initial representation of some unipotent subgroup of G that's not trivial. And now we can play around with the fact that we can play with normalizers. Um, so first, W intersect U, we want to show that this is an initial representation for P. Um, well, W intersect U is normal in U because U is really just Rn, right? It's the unipotent radical of SON1, which is just a copy of, I guess, I always get my numerology wrong. It's, I, I think it's Rn minus one. Um, and this is just some RK sitting in Rn minus one. And so I can extend, you know, this initial representation is not just an initial representation for W intersect U, but for U. And then because U is the unipotent radical of P, it's normal in P. And so it's actually the initial representation for P. So just playing around with normalizers and the result on the last side, we see that we have a, initial representation for P. Um, uh, there's a complicated step here that where I say that G is, this is J is trivial. And that uses this fact that I said that the L's are restricted. And I don't wanna say anything more about that. That's actually a complicated algebraic step in our proof is that the choice of L lets us decide that J is trivial. Um, and that's useful because then I can take this P representation and in P there's also this Carton subgroup that defines the geodesic flow. Um, I can restrict my P representation to an A representation. It stays initial just because J is trivial and you can't have, you know, and I define the initial representation to be the one with the smallest stabilizer and you can't get smaller than the trivial group. And so then it becomes an initial representation, not just for A, but for the normalizer of A. And then, the fact is that the normalizer of A and P generate G. Um, so this suffices by the other broader Furman proposition. So, you know, once you set up the language of the proof and prove one technical lemma that's hiding in this point too, uh, the proof really is roughly as long as this slide. Um, 
Um, it's a page in the paper. So I'm lying when I say it's as long as the slide, but it's not much longer. Um, and this is, you know, it's very soft and very simple once you set the language up correctly and learn to use it correctly. Um, and this is, you know, really something that I, I, I say not to brag about it, but to give kudos to Bader and Furman for simplifying the language of super rigidity proofs enough that we could do this. And now I seem to be a minute over time, so I'm going to stop here. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, very nice talk. Uh, are there any questions um, from the audience? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Yes, please. Oh, I think you're muted. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. You're, you're now unmuted. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that you showed the totally geodesic submanifolds were closures of W orbits, right? Yes. So are these again the orbit of some larger subgroup containing W? Yes. And, 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 and really most of what happens that's complicated is if W is say SO21 sitting in SO51, W has a centralizer in there that's the compact group got it. I have to get my numerology right. In that case, it will be SO3. And, 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 and the orbit closure might be an orbit of SO21 times SO3 instead of an orbit of SO21. And so it, it, you know, it's, not very, it's not very different from just a closed W orbit, but it is a closed orbit of a slightly larger group that's normally just a compact extension of the group you started with. So they, that way, it's superficially similar to Raghunathan's conjecture. I mean, these are not unipotent groups, the W, but. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, we're very much, I, I, maybe I said it too fast. We're very much using, you know, not just Raghunathan's conjecture, but it's proof and, and strong consequences of its proof. Because I, I, Raghunathan, I, can't, I can never remember there's history of this conjecture that I always get wrong because we need measures and not just orbit closures in the proof. We're using, you know, what is it actually, you know, Donnie's, yeah. he, Donnie's, it's Donnie's, Donnie's yeah. conjecture, which, which, which at least in America, people uh, too often claim was also Raghunathan's, um, but it's Donnie's. Um, and I can't remember which one of them it was at some point very early in the history of this, you switched from unipotent subgroups to groups generated by unipotent subgroups. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, 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 and we're doing the same thing. I mean, when Margulis, you know, follows this philosophy introduced by Raghunathan to prove the Oppenheim conjecture, he's looking at SL2R actions, um, okay. which are groups generated by unipotence. So back all okay. the way in the history of that subject, you know, okay. RWs fit that history perfectly. Okay. Thank you. Except, yeah, except for the compact extension doesn't. That's why I need to have this little quibble is because the compact extension is no longer generated by unipotence. Yeah. So nobody okay. studies that. And, and you know, that's why it's orbit closures, not orbits of group that we study. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, any, any other questions? Um, yeah, so I have a, a quick thing. Um, so one of the things uh, this G mod W is is in your case non compact, right? Very often. Yes. And uh, in Margulis, that was compact, correct? G mod. Yes. P. Um, does that not create any trouble in the proof? Surprisingly, it creates none. Oh. Um, um, and and somehow this was already observed in some sense. When Margulis wrote his original proof, not only did he have G mod P that was compact, but he proved that the image wasn't just an arbitrary quotient of algebraic groups, but actually a Grosmanian, uh -huh. so also compact. Yeah. And the first observation, which was made by Zimmer, was that you didn't actually care that this was a Grosmanian. You just had to care that it was an algebraic variety of any kind, so you didn't care if it was compact. Uh, I see, um, I see, I see, um, I see. And that was in, 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 in the range. And, and now mm -hmm. Botter and Furman have really carried that back to the domain 
Um, they have a rather awkward preprint on the archive, which they call um, super rigidity for non lattices, I think, um, which is it, it's a paper with a nice idea and no applications currently. Um, um, where, where really what they do is they point out that you know you don't need you don't not only do you not need compactness of this G mod W you don't need compactness or finite volume of G mod gamma even you need a few ergodic properties of the action you know and this is again it really is just axiomatizing and generalizing what happens in Margulis's original proof is like if you look at what he's using he starts out with a measurable map between compact manifolds and doesn't actually use anything any compactness properties. Um, um, and so it doesn't, you know, it doesn't actually change anything to give up compactness because you were never using it. Uh, um, <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, Great. Okay. Um, the, the other thing is, um, at some point you said this, if V is chosen correctly, then, uh, you, you extract an invariant line bundle. Mm -hmm. Um, can you say a little bit more about that and what's careful choice and what's the line one, what, what kind of stuff? I mean, if it can be said or yeah, refer to some particular part of the paper. I, 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 I'll tell you, but it may be too fast. Okay. So, so I can tell you very literally. Mm -hmm. um, so um, one thing we're using that I've hidden, which I probably mm -hmm. shouldn't have because certainly Raghunathan is one of the names that goes on this, but the list is very long. Um, is that we know already of our manifold, we don't know that gamma is arithmetic, but we know already that it's defined over some number field. Um, mm -hmm. um, okay. And then really what it means to have a closed W orbit is to have W also defined over the same number field. Um, and then what, and it also means that, you know, there's a W, W has, you know, the subgroup, you know, W intersects gamma in a lattice in W is maybe yeah. an easier way to say that. But then really what we're looking at is, you know, because the kind of representation we're looking at is a Galois conjugation, yeah, you know, um, or something like that is a change of valuation. L is really G becoming L by some operation. And because W is defined over the same field, W yeah. becomes some subgroup, maybe I'll call it H sitting in L by yeah. some kind of similar yoga. And then what I do is I really just look at the representation on the Lie algebra of my L and I take an exterior product to force yeah. L to be one dimensional. Okay. And, 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 and L somehow is carrying all the data of W um, by oh, how oh, I build oh. things. Uh, no, you you take an exterior product and uh, oh I you know, see I, uh, you, I, you have, you you have a, some sub algebra of some Lie algebra and you want it to be one dimensional instead of whatever dimension it is so you just uh -huh. wedge up to okay. make this okay. d dimensional okay. object one dimensional okay and okay. so you really you really are using in that in that in this one sentence I am using a tremendous amount of structure I mean it's not a hard argument mm. once you know the structure but it it uses a lot of structure of of these lattices and a lot of historical results. But, but it really, in, in the end, it's really, if you know what you're looking for, it's just like, oh, I have an invariant subspace. I wedge up so my invariant subspace is one dimensional, uh -huh. which is something that happens, you know, dozens of other places in the same theory. Yeah. Um, so, so it's not, you know, it, it's, you know, if you know your way around, it's not a novel thing to do, but it is, it is a little tricky. Mm -hmm. Great, terrific. So, 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 thanks a lot, David. I mean, that was that was that was just fantastic. Okay.